Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Heather Waka and Leah Parker. Leah was born in Seattle, Washington, and graduated from Mount Lake Terrace High School, north of Seattle. And then she went to American University in Washington, D.C., and got a degree in literature and theater arts. Then she came here to UW-Madison and received a Master of Arts degree in English, and she'll be finishing up her PhD in English in 2019. The parties are scheduled for May, August, and December. <laughs> Heather Waka was born in Lincoln, Nebraska, and graduated from high school in Des Moines, Iowa. She went to Hamlin University in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, where she majored in French. And then she got both a Master's of Arts and a PhD degree from the University of Iowa in medieval history. In 2016, she came to UW-Madison uh, to talk as a postdoc with the Council of Library and Information Resources. Their topic is one near and dear to my heart since I worked as a, in high school as a student at the Dixon Public Library where it's always fun to find really old stuff. <laughs> old stuff then was like from the 1870s. <laughs> You're talking about old stuff. <laughs> Tonight their talk is entitled A Library of Stains, Using Multispectral Imaging to Analyze Stains in Medieval Manuscripts. I'd like to point out that I usually give people bottles of water, but tonight I brought coffee for these folks, since coffee makes a much better stain. <laughs> water leaves a mark, too. Oh, water leaves a mark, too. That's happy. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming both Heather and Leah to Wednesday Night at the Lab. <laughs> Thank you very much, first, for coming out tonight on this very beautiful evening. We're excited to be here. We'd like to thank all of the organizers, and Tom in particular, for inviting us to present at Wednesday night at the lab. My name is Heather Waka. I'm a CLEAR postdoc fellow here at the University of Wisconsin, associated with the Center for the History of Print and Digital Culture in the iSchool and the English Department, and Leah Parker. My co-presenter is a doctoral candidate in the English department who's generously contributed her time and knowledge to the data analysis part of this project. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to talk tonight for about 50 minutes about a project that we've been working on over the last year that uses multispectral imaging to help analyze stains that are found in medieval manuscripts. But before we go any further, I think it's important at this point to add a small caveat, especially given the nature of this Wednesday Night of the Lab series. series. Uh, neither of us is a scientist, just putting that out there. So if at the end of the presentation you have any specific questions about the scientific underpinnings of this project, I will be happy to contact our specialist collaborators and try and get you the answers that you might be looking for. As an introduction to our talk, I'm going to play a 90-second video that was produced by the University of Birmingham in the UK. Mike Toth, the speaker in the video, and one of our collaborators on this project explains very concisely how multispectral imaging is used to investigate a possible undertext or palimpsest on folios from one of the earliest surviving Qurans written during the lifetime of Muhammad or very shortly after his death in 632 CE. So we're going to get this going. Multispectral imaging is when one uses the different wavelengths of light to try to reveal residues and texts and anything that's in an object that's not seen by the 
colors, light starting in the ultraviolet through the visible, the red, green, blue, on up to the infrared. And then we combine those images, that stack of images, to better show things that are in the object that you cannot see. I think in this image here. One of the strengths of multispectral imaging is to be able to see whether or not there is text underneath the text that we see with the naked eye. We have used multispectral imaging to try to reveal texts that have been scraped off and overwritten. In other words, a palimpsest. To date, we have seen no evidence of any other inks or texts underneath the text that is currently visible on the Birmingham. Okay, so like the Birmingham Quran project, the Library of Staines project, also known as the Lebeculi Vivi project, or the hashtag Stain Alive project, <laughs> is using multispectral imaging to gather scientific data. But instead of looking for the undertext, we're looking for data drawn from stains found on parchment, paper, and bindings in medieval and early modern books. Although multispectral imaging technologies have proven to be increasingly valuable for the study of cultural heritage objects, especially in regards to revealing palimpsests and identifying pigments, there is very little pre-existing scholarship that has used imaging methodologies to try to characterize the stains found in medieval manuscripts. Our project evolved from the interests of three clear postdoctoral fellows in data curation for medieval studies. Dr. Aaron Connolly at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, University of Pennsylvania Libraries, whose research interests focus on medieval medicine. Dr. Alberto Campagnolo at the Library of Congress, who researches the book in general and how to model a book in, as an object in the digital world. And myself at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, whose research addresses how the materiality of manuscripts informs the historical context and content of that manuscript. Each of our institutions holds a significant manuscript and or print collection, and each of us is working on independent digital projects that intersect with those collections in some way. The Library of Staines project brings together these multiple institutions thanks to a Council of Library and Information Resources microgrant. And because of this generous support, we were also able to include three other very important collaborators in the project. Fenella of France, Chief Preservation Officer at the Library of Congress, as well as Michael Toth, who you saw in the video, and Bill Christensberry, both who provided the multispectral imaging equipment, as well as invaluable guidance during the imaging process at the universities of Pennsylvania, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Thus, from the outset, there was a natural confluence between all of our interests and backgrounds, which has culminated in a year-long pilot study that we hope, as Mike described, will bring what is usually invisible to the naked eye into the visible and provide new insights for accessing and studying information concerning the material makeup and historic uses of books. Why stains? you may ask. Well, one of the reasons is because of the intimate human connection between this and this. <laughs> As humans, we've all dropped coffee on a favorite paperback, or read an old letter stained with tears, or left traces of our own blood in a recipe book after too much excitement with a new knife. <laughs> the Library of Stains Project seeks to highlight this human experience that draws a connection between medieval and modern interactions with manuscripts. And in so doing, we hope to broaden public engagement with manuscripts to include those whose beauty may not lie in the consummate skills of an illuminator or a binder, but in the human imperfections of daily life. Indeed, it's been our experience that once you spend hours going through manuscripts looking only for stains, you can never unsee a stain again. In addition to public engagement, we also seek to draw scholarly attention to books that have often been overlooked due to heavy soiling and damage. 
effects that can diminish their perceived quality and value. But the very stains that cause some scholars to dismiss a manuscript in fact carry important material information about the manuscript. For example, if a stain next to a medical recipe can be identified as an ingredient of that recipe, then we can know that the book was being used as an aide mémoire and that the recipes were actually being followed as written. Or, if a book has wax stains throughout multiple folios, we may begin to surmise that the book was likely being read or written in the early morning or at night. And this would mean different things to different people depending on where they lived. For librarians and conservators, the identification of stains such as mercury would be very useful when deciding how best to handle a given manuscript. Drawing from the collections of our home institutions, as well as two tangential institutions, Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia and the University of Iowa, we were able to gather data from a broad genre of manuscripts and thus a broad genre of stains. At the Library of Congress, we imaged some of the early printed books from the Rosenwald Collection. We also imaged medical manuscripts at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries and Chemical Heritage Foundation. And at the Universities of Iowa and here at Wisconsin, we imaged liturgical manuscripts as well as classical works copied by university students. This aggregate collection has presented pertinent and varied questions. The goals of the Library of Stains project were broadly conceived to address these kinds of questions and to provide the first data set for characterized stains commonly found on manuscripts and early printed books. A sound methodology for the replication of the data gathering and analysis process and the creation and implementation of an open source, open access database applicable to manuscript studies and librarian and conservation work. We hope to be able to equip researchers, libraries, and conservators with additional tools for analyzing their manuscripts in relationship to provenance, use, transmission, preservation, and materiality. The project timeline highlights the four main stages of our work within the course of a year. Stage one was a very preparatory phase where we developed our social media plan and we organized the logistics involved in coordinating and carrying out an ambitious imaging schedule in four different cities. Stage two involved imaging over 40 manuscripts at the various institutions during November and December 2017. The processing and analysis of the image data began in earnest in January 2018 and we're continuing this analysis as we present preliminary results. The final stage will focus on organizing the Library of Stains data in a repository, exhibitions of the manuscripts at the various institutions, publication, and a final assessment of the project. So this slide gives you a very general overview of our methodology. And we start with a folio. And because we're imaging it, we call it a side. And we gather the data from the stains. And that's basically taking images of this side. We then have to process those images. And after we've done the processing of the image, images, then we can begin the data analysis. Once we've got a set of results and we're just starting to bring together some of our results now, we can, we're, we've got three different conferences planned and a publication that will be coming, that will be submitted in the summer. Finally, uh, the last piece of this is to put together and publish the data that we've acquired in an online freely accessible database. And that's going to take two different forms. One will be a reference library that will be hosted at the University of Pennsylvania and here at the University of Wisconsin. And a second one uh, will be visualization of the STAINS projects. To differentiate those just a little bit, the data repository or the reference library will be mostly the images, the TIFF files that we have taken because those files really are raw data and anybody who wants to apply any kind of imaging software, uh, imaging analysis software can do so. They don't necessarily have to do STAINS. However, our part of the project is stains, and that's what we want to make sure that we get out in very 
accessible visualizations to the public so that the public can go back and really appreciate and love those medieval manuscripts like we do. <laughs> so this is where we started with the imaging. Uh, in a room, quite often this dark, and we have this kind of a setup. Here at the bottom, you've got your object. This is your manuscript. Up here above it, you've got a camera. We were using an 80 millimeter lens, and we were using a camera back of 60 megapixels, achromatic. And then over here on the sides, you've got your two lamps that are emitting specific wavelengths of light, at one at a time. And these are coming in mostly, we prefer they come in sort of at a 45 degree angle, and then they're reflected back up here, and the camera takes a picture. Um, I'm going to take you through sort of a very quick series of what those lights might look like. We were using for our project 10 different wavelengths going from the ultraviolet into the visible into the infrared at these values here, and it would look something like this. each one emitting just one of the wavelengths. Right, once we had a set of 10 images per side, then we needed to process those images. And for this, we brought in an image processing software called ImageJ software. This is completely freely accessible. You can download it after this talk tonight if you'd like. And it represents this top bar here. However, because of the nature of our project, Bill Christens Berry has developed two additional toolboxes to go with ImageJ software that help people who want to use multispectral imaging for cultural heritage objects, for this kind of project in particular. So here is the first one, and it's called a Paleo Prep Box, and it makes it very easy and streamlined to flatten our images. And basically, when we're flattening our images, we're just trying to create a uniform field of brightness across the entire image so that we narrow down any kind of false positives in our results. Uh, the other toolbox that Bill has created is called the Paleo Toolbox. And this adds some really nice uh, applications in addition to the ImageJ software. Uh, and he also then has included this little box that comes, that is constantly running as you perform tasks, and it's a log. And re it's very nice if you actually want to articulate or document your methodology as you're going through your image processing. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Leah, and she's going to take you through some specific, what it looks like specifically to go through some of our particular images that we did. Right, thank you. So this is the point in the analysis where I came in to help analyze all of the data acquired from the manuscripts at these different institutions. And I, t I handled the data analysis for the manuscripts at the University of Wisconsin. Heather handled the manuscripts at Iowa, and you'll get to hear about some of those later. But first, I want to step you through this process. So in order to analyze the stains in the processed images, we continued working in ImageJ. You open up 10 different image files, and you need to then create a stack. When we take, it's fairly easy to turn them into the stack. It's really just open the files, click images to stack. It's a really cool thing, though, when you get to scroll through it. So you have your stack of images. And this essentially, I want you to picture this like a stack of pancakes, where each image is a pancake layered on top of the others, because then, what we're going to do is plot a z-axis curve. And that's by taking a sample, if I can show you right here, and that gets measured into the values of this chart. And so what this is charting are the z-axis. And so the z-axis is like sticking a fork through a stack of pancakes. You have your x and your y that are flat, and then z-axis goes right down the middle. And so then this sample is essentially a third dimension measurement of the same spot on all 10 different images. And that's your z-axis. And so that gives us a curve like this one. But the trouble is that this curve actually isn't scaled right so that each wavelength is appropriately spaced along the color spectrum. So we need to take that data, the numeric data, and transfer it out into Excel, which is where we do all of our curve generation. 
So we get this table of numbers, which are the mean intensity values of the pixels in the area that has been sampled, with a different value for each image in the stack and each, a different value for each image at different wavelengths, so that when we chart against the appropriate wavelength, they produce a spectral curve at the correct scale that we can compare against other stains in the same side or against stains in other sides. So before we do the curves in Excel, I want to say a few words about how we pick where the samples come from. How do we decide what to sample? And so for starters, I can show you essentially a recreation of what the stack looks like and how we move through it. It's like a flip book that we can move through and see the different monochromatic images of the same side with different wavelengths of light. How cool is that? So, for example, something we can notice in this, which is a piece of music that you'll hear more about later, in this image, at this wavelength, you have inks with the lyrics, you have inks making musical notes, and you have inks marking the stave of music. But at this wavelength, the stave starts to disappear. The stave is apparently not reflecting to the same extent that the words and the musical notes themselves are reflecting at. And so that's an indication that perhaps they might have different spectral curves. So that's one way of knowing we might want to sample the different inks. Of course, sometimes a manuscript is just really dirty and it's easy to see that there are stains there. So again, as a reminder, we have our z-axis going through multiple different layers of the stack, measuring the reflectance at a single spot across 10 images. In order to measure exactly where we've taken our samples. We've recorded them um, specifically where they are on the page, not the just generally this is the ink, but specifically where on the page we're taking this, because we need to find a particularly dense instance of a stain. And in some cases, a side will be very simple, like this one. It has uh, the parchment. We always check the parchment, as well as whether it's paper or parchment. We check the main ink, if there's ink writing on the page, or different inks, and then a couple of stains, which might be distinct, but that are probably representative of what's going on. And that's a fairly simple one. And at this point, I do want to point out that, as a control, we also sample this white box right here. And you'll notice it's labeled Macbeth. That's a protocol that we uh, are following from the Library of Congress's way of doing multispectral imaging. So we're not calling out the Shakespeare play ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so the Macbeth value is basically a control because what we're doing in Excel, and we'll get there in just a moment, is taking a simple formula of dividing the reflectance from the places we sampled over the control, the Macbeth, to produce the reflectance that is controlled across all of the different um, wavelengths. So we have some very simple sides like this where there's just an ink, a couple of stains, and it's fairly easy to decide what to sample. Other slides look like this. And you have a lot of stains, maybe some writing. This one actually had some writing that wasn't visible to the naked eye, but at certain wavelengths it showed up. Uh, and then you have stains overlapping on top of each other, and it's very difficult to tell what is similar, what is different, and how do we uh, decide how to measure it. So this is where the spectral curves come in. So we bring our mean intensity values into Excel. And it looks something like this. We control for Macbeth. That's this formula that's going on over here. Each of these chunks of numbers is going to be a different sample from the side. And then we have several of those lined up, fitted into this chart, which gives us spectral curves. And from here, we can start to compare and untangle the spectral curves. So these are the curves from that very complicated manuscript. If we zoom in on those, well, they look kind of similar, but it's actually kind of hard to tell. So one way we go about analyzing is simply blowing up the y-axis so that we can get a better look at the lines of the curves separately. And this super complicated manuscript actually turns out to be fairly simple. Because if you'll notice, a lot of these curves are following a very similar path with this bump down here toward the blue end of the spectrum, and then this larger curve up over by the red end of the spectrum. And you'll notice, of course, they do not line up perfectly. So we're not about to start making a claim that these are the exact same compound all over this side, 
but we can say that it's probably a fairly similar compound. And there are a couple of reasons why these lines might not line up perfectly and still be either similar or the same compound. Uh, one explanation might be that they're the same compound at different intensities, either a particularly dense spill versus a watered down spill. Um, they might have a slightly different composition. We know that things like ink recipes weren't always followed exactly or the measurements weren't precise and so it could be the same ink but in a different batch so it's a slightly different formulation. It could also be an older stain of a very similar ink or other compound. And another thing that might come into play is that the environment in which the stain is exposed to light, air, heat, humidity, things that could affect the aging of the stain could affect part of a manuscript differently than other parts. So those are some reasons why we can say that even though these have some important distinctions between the curves, the general shape being so similar suggests that they are in some way related, or at least that some of them are related in families <coughs> of stains. And so another reason we can say be comfortable with the not so perfect matches is that when we put together similar inks that we know are similar inks, or that they can be from a bunch of different manuscripts, they do the same thing. So these are all of the blue inks that we sampled from Wisconsin manuscripts. And you'll notice that they have this, generally have this big spike at the beginning. That's the blue part of the spectrum of visible light. So it's common sense that that would be a big part of how they are showing up in the spectral curve. But then we also have these features where a lot of them have another little bit of a bump back here. And so we can start to characterize like, okay, there are a couple of different ways that blue inks show up as spectral curves. And we can do the same thing with red inks. We had a lot more red inks than blue inks. We can see that they have a pretty high reflectance at the red end of the spectrum. And so seeing that across manuscripts, the spectral curves for these colored inks are showing up pretty closely together, that confirms a bit our method of comparing the curves and being able to see that even if they're not exact, they are probably related formulas. So I want to walk you through now a couple of the basic means by which we produce our preliminary results. So take you through a couple of sides from the same manuscript. Uh, these are two pages from different parts of the same manuscript codex or book. So they're not, if you open it up, it's not two facing pages, but they're from different parts of the same book. Um, I want to take you through how we went about sampling, identifying, and figuring out a little bit of what's going on with these sides. So first, let's look at this side. Um, what we have here is a dark ink that's most of the text. There's a red ink with some important text. You can also see in these little empty squares, there are, there are little letters written if you zoom in which are indicators for someone who's gonna come in later and draw a decorated initial, so like a large first letter. So there's, that hasn't happened yet. This manuscript you might call unfinished, but it seems to have gone into use. So those open spaces have a little letter written in them. And we don't know, generally, if that letter was made when the manuscript was being made as a cue for the artist, or if it was added in later by a user who decided, oh, this is obviously this letter to aid himself and future readers. Another interesting thing about this side is that down here in this red box is what's called a manicure, which is a, a pointing hand saying this is an important piece of text. We see them in a lot of late medieval and early modern manuscripts. So we have these two additional inks, and then we have a couple of stains. In this, it's lower here, but it's the outer margin. There we go. There we go. Uh, in the outer margin of the book, we have a couple of stains. So when we put these into a chart of curves, we've got a couple of pretty expected things. The parchment is this higher gray curve. Then we notice that these two curves, which are the initial notation in those little, the first letter of those blocks, and then the manicule are actually in very similar inks. So perhaps those happened at the same time. We also see that these two stains are fairly similar as well, except that they spike up at the beginning. And that's a pretty common thing we're seeing when something is a fairly thin or light stain. It's basically the parchment showing through. So what we can see here is that these stains are basically inks, probably. The 
there's a strong likelihood, given how close they are, especially at the high end of the spectrum, that those stains were made by the same person who drew the manicule and possibly also filled in the, the first letter of those text blocks. So that's exciting. We're seeing a person making a stain. But sometimes we have more exciting stains than that even. <laughs> this one, we, we use it in a lot of our process presentations because it's just such an exciting side in that like, what could possibly have been spilled on this page? Spoiler, we don't know, but we can tell you some stories about what we think it might be. So, so this page had a bit more going on, but it's again from the same manuscript. We have our dark ink, we have our red ink, uh, we have another bit of marginalia and a similar ink to the ones from the last side. There were also some parchment distortions that I measured. They weren't anything exciting, but I wanted to explain those for you. So we sampled this big ring stain, and stain one, is the ring stain. There's also another one, but it's not as interesting. So what we get in our spectral curves, again, is fairly expected. Here's our parchment curve all up there. And then down in, in the curves in here, we can see that our stain one doesn't really match anything else. It kind of matches stain two. So OK, that's probably a splatter of the same thing making the ring. But really, stain one stands alone. It's not anywhere near a match for the inks on the page. And that maybe isn't surprising because that would be a very strange way to spill your ink. But it tells us something very interesting in that we can now move ahead and think about what else it could be. We'll say more later about our control samples that we're putting together, but we can test whether it's maybe tea or oil or wine uh, just to see what might have discolored the parchment in that way. And that's something that we can take in future directions. So these kinds of um, ways of thinking about individual sides of manuscripts, we're calling stain stories. And this is something that I inherited from a journalism and geography scholar studying soil stories, so I'm stealing it. But we're calling these stain stories because what we can do is create fragmentary narratives of a manuscript's history and its use based on the spectral signatures of its curves. So by looking at those graphs and looking at the pictures and looking at where we took our samples and what the stains look like, we can start to tell stories about these stains. And for now, of course, these are always hypotheses. These are hypothetical stories of what might have happened because there's always a sense of uncertainty with this kind of history. And we also don't have quite the large enough category, uh, catalog of spectral curves to make certain identifications. But for now, we have relative data, relational data that's not necessarily hard and fast identification. So it's giving us goals for future inquiry at this stage. So to recap from the sides I just talked about, the first one with the manicule, we can think of the person going through and writing in the letters of the initials to be drawn later by an artist. They were maybe going to have someone do it after they've owned the book. Um, they were kind of careless with their ink and smudged it in the margin, perhaps. For the bit larger ring stain, we can say that this is almost certainly not ink. And the possibility remains open that it could be any of a number of characteristic stains like wax, wine, oils, chemicals, or other compounds that we have not even dreamed of finding in medieval manuscripts. But now that we have this baseline, we can go find out more about that particular side stain story. And now I'd like to hand it over to Heather to talk a little bit about wax. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so my first stain story is a story about wax. And it's based on this question you see here. Can we use the clear identification of wax and its spectral curve on one folio to match stains on other folios and other manuscripts? And I start with these two very heavy dark lines down here at the bottom of the spectral curve. These two come from a folio. They're two stains on the same folio in a Psalter held at the University of Iowa. And they are wax. And I know this because you can see the wax on the folio. It's still there. And it's thick. And I think that's probably why down here, 
there's a bit of a gap here because what you're seeing here is the real wax, the very intense wax. And what happened then is I took these curves and I thought to myself, well, I went through all the other spectral curves and I said, are there any curves in other manuscripts or on other sides that might match these wax curves that I'm pretty certain are wax? And yes, I found at least four in the University of Iowa collections, and I'm going to take you through those a little bit. But these you will see are residues. The wax is no longer on the actual page. All that's left is the residue of the wax. And I think that's probably why we're seeing this discrepancy at the lower end of the spectrum. But these here are the exact folio. You're gonna, you can't see it super well here, but what's circled in blue, those are the wax stains. The wax is still there. If you had it in front of you, you would see the wax. You could feel the wax, and it's definitely wax. And those two, again, are the two stains that create this very bottom dark curve here. This is a folio from the same manuscript. And this stain, too, which is right here, is one of those other lines just above it. This is a folio from the same manuscript. And this stain here, right on the edge of the page, also matches that curve. And it is not the same as this stain over here. This stain is from a completely different manuscript. And it's right here, near the gutter of the manuscript. It matches with the others. It is not a match with this stain or this stain. And this stain here also is, uh, matches with the others, as does this one. I didn't circle it, but it does. Uh, they are the same stain. And they match this similar curve that I've just been talking about of wax. And I think what's really interesting here in this wax story is that you can start to see that a lot of these stains are on the outskirts or in the margins of the folio. And now you can start to see the, fo the manuscript in front of a person who is holding a candle either at the top or the side or the bottom, but certainly around the margins of the manuscript, not over the manuscript. And this one in particular, if this is your manuscript and your candle's right here and perhaps we're turning a page and we accidentally knock the candle and it splatters onto the manuscript. And that's my wax stain story. I'm now going to pass it over to Leah for another kind of stain story. Thank you. But first, I get to do my favorite part of the talk. So, some implications of Heather's wax story. For my field, which is Anglo-Saxon studies, the study of English literature before the Norman Conquest, primarily in Old English, I want to introduce you to the Exeter book, which is one of the four major codices surviving containing Old English poetry. It contains a lot of major poems, including Seafarer, the Wanderer, um, many of the Ex well, all of the Exeter book riddles, which are fabulous. You should read them. It also contains two poems that I write about in my dissertation. So it has a special place in my heart, and it's also mar marvelously stained. So <laughs> zooming in just on this sort of the, what's the front page now, we have one of those ring stains. We have this huge spill of something dark. And if you also look at these markings here, at some point it's been used as a cutting board. <laughs> I want to point out that these are poems about the birth of Christ. And for most of its history, this book was held in a cathedral. So I have a lot of questions about what circumstances led to it being used as a cutting board. But speaking of wax, there's also this damage to the manuscript. This is the back of the book. At some point, something burned it. We know that these are burns because of singeing, but several poems on these last pages are damaged. The ones in this opening are The Husband's Message and the appropriately named Ruin. And here's the thing, we don't really know how it was burned. It's not like most manuscripts that are burned that are all singed around the edges because the library caught on fire. Some theories are, though, that either a hot poker was dropped on it or that a candle fell on it. And I believe if we were able to get multispectral images of the Exeter book and recognize the spectral curves of wax around the edges of these holes in the manuscript, it's not like we're bringing back additional letters or words or poems 
but we can give this damaged book just a little bit of history in terms of the exciting moment in which a substantial chunk of Old English literature was destroyed. So that's that stained story, but let's talk more about music. We saw a bit of this manuscript before um, I stepped you through a sample stack of one of these sides. So this is a manuscript that is held in the University of Wisconsin collections over in Memorial Library. We took three sides from it, but it's all one piece. So you can see that it sort of curves around and there's some overlap here. The interesting thing about this manuscript is that it's a single piece of parchment that at some point was part of a book of music. And then at some point was taken apart and used as the cover of a book, a codex. So you can see that here in this middle side, that's the spine of a book with very characteristic wear. And naturally, as the cover of a book, it also got stained. So we have some questions about this. We want to know, are these stains from when this piece of parchment was the cover of a book? Are some of them from when it was a page in a music book? And potentially, what was getting spilled on this book? So we took a lot of samples, quite a few, because there are a couple of different inks on each side. There are a couple of different stains on each side. And the spine is particularly exciting because it's just dark everywhere. And when you put all of these different samples together, we end up with this chaos. <laughs> these are all of the samples from all three sides put together into one chart. Uh, don't worry about interpreting it because I'm going to break it out for you. So let's start with the inks. We have here these two higher curves. These are samples from the music staves. And remember back in the stack when we were flipping through it, the musical staves disappeared a bit where the ink doing the lyrics didn't? That's what's happening here. These have such a different curve that they disappear in some wavelengths. And these, again, are not very close together. They're probably the same ink because they're the staves, the lines that the music is written on, on the same, ultimately the same page, just on different sides of what became a cover of a book. So a hypothesis for why they're so far apart is that maybe one of them got a lot more wear than the other. Maybe one was exposed to light more, maybe one got dirtier based on which side of the book it was on. So that's the staves. We have another ink here, which is actually a fairly typical black ink curve. It's a bit of writing on the manuscript. But then we have all of these guys, all of these dark inks down here, which are actually peculiarly low for even black inks. And so I came up with this hypothesis that these dark inks, which I started calling the low writers, that they might help us establish or develop some information about this manuscript. Because currently, right now, we don't know exactly when this manuscript was made, when it was turned into a book, or where either of those things happened. I thought maybe the lowrider inks, if we can connect them to other manuscripts that have similar inks, that might start to develop a pattern in terms of geographical areas or moments in time where this ink formulation is in use. So. I assembled all of the dark black inks, the potential low writers, from across the Wisconsin and Iowa manuscripts that we sampled. And again, uh, because they're very dark, we need to blow up the y-axis, but looking at them very closely, they're actually not very similar after all. The upshot is there's no low writer, really, but sort of a family of low writers that have some similar characteristics. And it's actually by putting these inks from the music manuscript in the context of other dark inks that we can see that they're actually very similar after all. So the music manuscript's dark inks are these yellowish green and blue curves that compared to the other crazy curves are actually fairly similar to one another. These curves going all over the place, they are not probably the same ink formulation. They're just also very dark. One interesting thing I do want to point out is that these two are a curious, very close match. And you've been noticing, we keep talking about why they're not perfect matches. This is a suspiciously perfect match. And the darker of these two is actually something that is in an Iowa manuscript that Heather, from examining it in person, has good reason to believe is rust. And so if this 
the lighter orange is also kind of rust, we might wonder, okay, it has this bump down here like the inks do. Is this perhaps an ink that is composed partially of iron, which is not an uncommon thing, but a particularly rusty iron? That's an interesting thing we might follow up on. But let's turn back to the stains, because remember, there were a lot of them. So the first stain we can talk about is one that turns out to match the ink of the staves. So it's this stain here, you can see extending sort of from the stave. Looks like it might have even been a mistake before or after the lyrics were written, and it's hard to tell. Um, but it's got a very similar curve to that of the stave. So that's probably the same ink. And then we have a slightly more exciting one. <laughs> Over around the spine, we have these, it's duplicated here because it's two different angles, but there's this big stain that respects the line of the spine. And that means to me that it was, it was stained after this was a book cover because that would be a very weird coincidence for it to be stained along those lines when it's just a flat piece of parchment and then it's, that's just where the spine is. So it's probably after it became a book. And then if we go back to those curves, these two close ones in the middle, those are two different samples of that definitely the same stain because it's the same stain from different angles. These two are two other stains. So if we've got those two, there are two more stains that have very similar curves, though different intensities. So related, but not necessarily, like they don't have the same curve in the same way that the two that are the same stain from different angles do. And what I find interesting about this is that if you think about this being folded as a book, because it was the cover of a book, you have a stain along the spine. You have another stain on what we might think of as the front cover. But then there's also this other stain on what would then be the back cover. And so somehow, whatever this is, stained both the front and the back of the book. And my inclination is to assume that someone has their book folded open and plopped down on the table the way we try not to treat our books today. But then it wouldn't have that really neat line right along the spine of where the stain wasn't really able to seep. So there's something interesting going on there. And finding out what that might be could tell us a lot, I think, about what this manuscript has gone through, what it's seen in its many <coughs> centuries. So for comparison, we have this other stain, the one that's probably the same ink as the staves. This is probably a stain that was made when the, book was being, when the manuscript was being written. But the other stains, all of these ones in red circles, those were probably made when it was a book, when it was the cover of a book. And for future consideration of this stain story, we might think more about how to match spectral signatures of different kinds of inks and stains to give us information about date and place of origin for manuscripts. That's something that may be able to get developed in the future. But we also want to think about whether these non-ink stains can be determined um, to identify so we can determine something about how this book was used, how the parchment was used when it was the cover of the book. So would you like to do one more stain story? Sure. <laughs> if you will indulge me. <laughs> so this is the last stain story that we have here. It comes from my colleague Alberto Campagnolo at the Library of Congress. It's, uh, the manuscript itself comes from the Car uh, Chemical Heritage Foundation, Othmer One. Early 15th century recipes, textual extracts of alchemy, medicine, metalworking, and cosmetics. So at first glance, you're looking at this stain and you're thinking that could be some really cool thing, right? Spoiler alert. Okay, so we image it and we image the stain as an entire unit and we get these spectral curves. So here is the ink pretty standard spectral curve for ink. Uh, this is the paper, the purple, and then we get, uh, sorry, the blue is the paper, and then the purple is the stain. And it's a little bit erratic, and it doesn't really say much other than it's not paper and it's not ink. So when Alberto then went back through the images, he realized that the images, something that is not visible, when you just look at the manuscript, there's actually ruling on these images. 
and the ruling underneath, which is very usual for medieval manuscripts, but it's not necessarily visible to the eye. And again, this is probably not unusual in the sense that especially if a medieval manuscript has passed through a book dealer in the 20th century at some point, they may have erased the ruling or got tried to get rid of the ruling as if it was something that was detracting from the value of the book. But once he realized that there was ruling as well, he went back and redid his methodology and instead then decided to image the center part of the stain, the darkest part, as well as an outside part of the stain. And there you start to see very interesting results because the center, green, almost follows identically the ink that is used for the writing. And the outside of the stain, which is this light blue, almost follows identically a different, slightly different ink that was used for the ruling. And so basically in this stain story, what we get, two different stains. What we assumed at one point was one stain, it's two, and the one on the top would have been made, likely been made when the ruling was taking place, which is always before the writing. So two different stains, two different times, two different moments in this manuscript's stain story. So I want to say a few words as we move toward concluding about why this matters, why this is important to us as scholars of various different fields. For me, as an Anglo-Saxonist, as a medievalist, even these preliminary results give us so many new directions. So they're all preliminary results that we don't have any hard and fast answers yet. And the goal here is to develop a methodology, right? The beginnings of a methodology. We can already affirm, though, from our work over the last several months, the value of these methods for the humanities as a whole, and especially for medieval studies and manuscript studies. Because the study of medieval manuscripts is not just about language and literature, even for someone like me who's housed in an English department. We're also investigating the cultural and historical contexts in which texts are created and distributed and received. We're investigating where a text was made or used or read and when was it made, used, or read? Who was doing the making, the using, or the reading? More abstractly, we care about the vehicle of language and literature in the Middle Ages. We care about the material cultural objects, the inks, the parchment, the pages, and the books themselves that are bearers of ideas, tellers of stories, and repositories of knowledge. And so we care how these manuscripts were treated as carriers of texts. And we want to investigate further how these manuscripts and texts were valued, or in some cases not. For example, how did the Exeter book, which spent most of its history in the possession of a cathedral library, come to be used as a coaster and a cutting board? In short, we want to know how people used their books. We want to learn more not just about the literature and the texts in these books, but also about the people and the culture and the history to which these books belonged. And Heather is going to share a bit about the next steps in that process. So in the course of this year, we've been able to get this far. We still have a few next steps that we are waiting for and will be doing before we finish up. One is actually imaging samples of known stains. So part of this entire project and part of the methodology is to create a sample database of known stains. And thus, we actually stained pieces of uh, handmade paper and parchment with certain stains that we thought would probably be common and might arise in the manuscripts here uh, that we are imaging, actually. So things like water, olive oil, red wine, iron gall ink, black tea, mold, and ammonia. The ammonia solution is our effort to replicate urine. And that's not as disgusting as it sounds. Uh, it just so happens that one of the uh, manuscripts that we imaged is actually called the color of urine. In the Middle Ages, doctors would look at the color of urine and they would gauge it according to a scale or a spectrum and do diagnoses of your illness, as it were. And in this manuscript that we imaged, the entire thing is covered with yellow stains. <laughs> and all we can imagine is some doctor accidentally spilling the vial onto the manuscript. So we just put that in there, we have to know. 
in the end, we have to know. These have not been imaged yet. They're waiting to be imaged. As soon as they are, they will give us a set of spectral curves against which we can compare several of the curves that we have already imaged. Uh, next step is to get our data organized because we are absolutely committed to making it open access and sharing it with other scholars. Uh, as I talked about earlier, this will be a data repository of images, raw images, TIFF files um, that show the layers basically for each side and then scholars can take that and they can use any analytical tools they want on that. It doesn't have to be stains, they may want to look at pigments, they may want to look at inks, they may want to look at parchment or the substrate. Um, and then in this we will also include a methodology of what we did so that others can follow it. But also important is this idea of a data visualization. And for this, we're using a different environment. And this is the digital map environment that uh, Martin Foyce is going to be talking about on May 16th. Uh, it's been recently released, designed and developed by Martin in the English department here at the University of Wisconsin. And this works for us absolutely perfectly because in it we can upload the, tip, uh, the image as a JPEG. We can create a highlight around the stain or the area that we actually imaged. And then we can link that, create annotations and link that to various different pieces of data that are associated with that highlight. This is just a mock-up of a testing kind of model. It'll probably be a little bit more um, robust than what I've just got on this slide. But this will be able to be done for every side that we imaged at Iowa and Wisconsin and will be freely accessible and open to the public as well. Yeah. That's it. We want to thank you so much for coming and listening to our stain stories tonight. Uh, we would be happy to answer any questions that you have at this point. Oh, geez. Uh, right in front first. Uh, uh, one of the stains that I would I don't know how people wrote, but I would expect stains from sweating and oils on the skin and things like this to be part of the parchment someplace. Uh, have you looked at that as a possibility as one of the reasons for stains? I have an answer. Do you have an answer? Can, can you repeat? <laughs> I'll comment that? on that. Um, Heather, can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, one of the stains that we might expect would be, as somebody wrote, sort of the oils of the skin or uh, bodily fluids actually on the, the page. And have we looked at that at all? Um, we haven't looked at that. I think that is something that uh, can be considered. I'm not sure that multispectral imaging is the best technology for something like that. There are other projects that are working on things like saliva and uh, other kinds of human bacteria on manuscript sides. Uh, the other reason I think that we probably didn't expect it so much is because actually a scribe when he or she is writing in the Middle Ages is not necessarily running their hand along the parchment. It's a very different process of holding the quill and it's a very meticulous process where you're really wanting to engage ink on parchment and nothing else. Does that help? It's much like how a person who is left-handed today learns how to write in a way that is not necessarily dragging their hand across the ink because they had ink that didn't dry as quickly. Um, there's an awful lot that's known about spectral properties of inks, papers, everything else. Uh, do you have any scientists that, are, uh, uh, that you're bringing to this? Uh, with those types of backgrounds. And secondly, uh, I know that you were, uh, had olive oil as one of the things you were going to test, but uh, there, uh, there's other sorts of fats and greases that yeah. potentially get onto the manuscript. Absolutely. That's only animal-based type of greases, yeah. for example. Yeah. Um, so our, do we have the imaging experts that have been using Science, you've been using multispectral imaging for inks and pigments, et cetera. Not necessarily multispectral. There are people 
began in a much higher resolution spectrums of, of various materials. And so right. I would think that would be a great uh, set of background information to have. Yes, and I think that's where our project really uh, contributes to the entire corpus of data in the sense that that's another imaging technology. We can take our results, we can compare them, we can see how they work together or not. Uh, we're, we were not particularly interested in the inks. I do know that Fenella France is working a lot at the Library of Congress with well, pigments. I mean, yeah, with pigments, sciences. right. Right, and there's also other uh, there's other multispectral imaging um, techniques, the XRF and things like this that are also working. So I think putting them all together in the end, we're not using those in this project. We're sticking with the multispectral imaging at the moment since it's really a pilot study. It's really a first foray and a one year fixed contract <laughs> kind of thing. Sorry. Do you want to tell them about the other projects? Which ones? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> there are some other cool projects going on which might suit your taste for harder sciences. Yeah, so uh, this is a project that's coming out of the BioArc Research Center in York. Again, something that might be interesting for us to compare our data to theirs eventually. And here they are doing protein analysis, DNA analysis, um, early results ca came out about this is the Gospel of Luke held at the Bodleian, 12th century, mm -hmm. and it's always been our assumption that, that parchment, they used a similar kind of parchment throughout a manuscript, a goat, or a sheep, or a cow, but here it's absolutely incredible that they were able to identify in the first four folios, they were alternating animal parchments. That will have been intentional, and yet we had no idea about that. And then you look at the very last three folios on the on, or choirs, sorry, on the choirs on the right, and you see that they've inserted some goat in the middle as well. And then the very, very last one is only um, sheep. So this also is very interesting. And then to look at some of our data and see if maybe that can compare eventually to the results here. There's also um, a woman in England, Kate Rudy, who's done a lot. I don't know if you know her. She's done uh, some work with what she calls her dirtometer, measuring dirty, how dirty um, manuscript pages get. And she's got a grant for next year, and she's going to be looking at stains in particular and doing protein analysis. So again, that'll be very interesting to compare the data. Yes. Hmm? Is it possible to date um, water stains, for instance? Take uh, Vatican manuscripts that are badly damaged with water. Is that something that happened in the 14th century or when they were taken up to Paris and brought back down in the 19th? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Is it possible to date particular stains to a given century or not? Um, that's something I would not feel comfortable doing with multispectral imaging at the moment. I do know that Fenella uh, France at the Library of Congress, she's working on pigments and because she's chief preservation officer, she wants to image these sides at regular intervals to see if the pigments are degrading or not. So she may be able to then set up a standard of degradation over a number of years mm -hmm. and from that sort of reverse engineer maybe some information like that yeah in the back there yep. thank you for a wonderful talk even if we missed a bit of it we're looking forward to seeing it online <laughs> um, i'd also like to publicly thank you for um, helping out to figure one of my daughter's um, pet book puzzles um, but i've got a question for you um, can you envision as your database emerges that you'll be able to create a material cultural spectral curve that as you get a feel for how a book is used over time, um, that you could metaphorically create a sense of the longevity of the book's use and how that changes over time, um, such that if you have many book stains that you've been analyzing, you'd then be able to detect broader patterns in book use. We would need a substantial data set. 
Big brain. Great. Yeah. Good uh, question. Yeah. So we could certainly start to hypothesize about building out of a substantially larger corpus of data patterns and ideas about how the use of books changes in different places at different times. Of course, as I know, you know, well, with medieval books, we don't know what we've lost. And so we can never assume that it's representative. In fact, we can pretty well assume that it's not because if a book was used really well, we probably lost it. So we have a skewed sample set, even if we do this to every page of every medieval manuscript that survives to this day around the world. And that right there is an impossible task as is. So we could build a selective corpus of data that can build some patterns. We would still be telling stain stories that are hypotheses. But I do think that our stain stories could eventually grow from being the story of a single side or a single manuscript and how it was used and turn into instead a story of the stains at a particular archive where we know these manuscripts were all held in the collection of Tom's Cotton or that we know that they were in this place in this century. Here's how some of them were being used in some way. We could eventually have a multi-manuscript stain story. Thanks well. Yes. Have you come across situations where, through the uh, various <coughs> levels of spectrum, you picked up images of something that was there before and attempted to be erased and the page used over? Uh, yeah, so basically I think you're asking, did we come across any images in our work that were under text or revealed palimpsests? Yes, uh, University of Iowa, there is a 15, 16th century book from Florence, a copy of Lucan's Pharsalia, and it has end sheets that are parchment. It's on paper, but it has two end sheets on either side that are parchment. And when there was a, a little suspicion that there might be undertext there, there was nothing on the pages. They were blank. They had some stains. We thought we'd go ahead and image them. We imaged them, and up came this erased text. And so we're still in the middle of transcribing it. It's two or three or four different paragraphs, each starting with item. And um, we need to just sit down and spend some time working with it. But yeah, it came up. And there was one, I don't think it was the one you mentioned. There was another one where we imaged the binding. Um, and there was text that came up in the multispectral imaging that you couldn't see. And it actually was Italian for something like uh, it was the call number that was that it was that it had been ascribed uh, in the Italian archives mm -hmm. somewhere before it came to before, the University yeah. of Wisconsin. Yeah. Question. Would doing database of stain analysis be applicable to textiles as well? It could be. Do you want to repeat the question? Would our database of stain analysis be applicable to textiles as well? And it certainly could be, although currently we haven't sampled anything that you might call a textile, but you could expand this database and take multispectral images of stains or pigments of, on different kinds of textiles and be able to develop that analysis, yeah. They do, they are using multispectral imaging on certain textiles to, if they've been written on in particular to, to get the writing, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Did you learn anything about the music, about when or where? Yeah, Heather's the music expert of this duo. <laughs> Heather's not a music expert, no. <laughs> um, did we speaking. learn anything about the music of when and where? Um, not anything concrete, no. But I think uh, with some more research, we could move towards something. Mm -hmm. We need more data, basically, in order to find inks that are similar, develop a better understanding of the text. I don't think we put any thought into what the text is, but that's like, for me no, normally, that, that's be, yeah. that would be where I'd start. Um, that needs to be identified. Yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yes. Have you done any multispectral imaging, or perhaps this falls in the next stage, of texts on cotton fiber paper? 
Yes. The question is, have we done any imaging on texts that are written or printed on cotton fiber paper? So for those of you who don't know, in the late medieval, early modern period, paper was not made from wood pulp, but from fibers, um, textile oh, fibers, essentially, that were beaten down and, and pulped, basically, and then laid out on a trough to dry into paper. So they're basically textiles, actually, and... And yes, yeah, some of the, there are quite a few of the manuscripts that we actually image that are on paper, 15th, 16th century. I think there was one, there was one that you showed at the very beginning, you didn't, it wasn't a stain story, but it was on, it's 17th century and it's on paper. Yep. Yeah. I think you mentioned um, that somebody's, one of your colleagues is going to do protein analysis. Yeah. So the spectral analysis is close to non-destructive, as okay. I think. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that you can take small samples from this and do amino acid sequencing, DNA sequencing that's, with, that's a destructive analysis? And if so, what kind of permissions do you have to get and what kind of sample size? <laughs> So the question is, can we do any kind of protein analysis on this, right? Yeah. And if so, how? Um, one of the answers to that question is, it's been done. <laughs> In the sense that um, Josh Calhoun from the English department was part of this project that is coming out of York. And there the actual technique is to take erasers, you take an eraser and you take little rubbings, and that those rubbings, when they are applied to the parchment, will take away little hairs with them, and from that you can um, examine and run protein sequences on those, that sample, and it's very, it's, it's not as invasive as other methodologies. But yes, this is something that will be really interesting because that data has yet to come out. And that data, there is data on the, with some of the Wisconsin manuscripts, some of the same ones that we use multispectral mm -hmm. imaging on. And so putting those two together will be really interesting. As an historical note, I can say in the 90, 1990s, um, I tried to do, get permissions to do um, hair follicle punch biopsies from National Library of Medicine and bodily and manuscripts um, using DNA sequencing at Hopkins and was shot down very, very quickly. The librarians both. And the great thing is, is the technology has improved. Yeah. The destructiveness has gone down. Um, yeah. But there's still caution from librarians. And we should. Yes. yes. And you asked about what kinds of permissions we would need we would need to fill out many forms and beg many people for permission. And it would very much depend on the, um, this construction of value that we give to cultural heritage objects in that many of the manuscripts we're working with here and in Iowa are relatively unstudied. We don't even necessarily know when they're made, when they're from. But I wouldn't say that they're not valuable. They're just less recognized as valuable. And so they're easier to gain access to. And that's true in Wisconsin as it is at the Bodleian and, and determining what we want to sample versus how we want to sample it is going to determine whether we're likely to get access. One of the nice things about multispectral imaging is that it is completely non-invasive. The only potential damage to the manuscript is that it gets moved and put in a nice little futon and then gets his picture taken. Uh, the exposure, <laughs> they're called futons, yes. Um, Why not Devin Ford? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so the only, um, the exposure from, oh, I had it written down and now it's gone, but the exposure three, of the light, it's equivalent to about three days on display in exhibition conditions. So it's a little bit of the degrading from light that happens whenever you expose a manuscript to light, but it's actually just negligible. It's much easier to start with that and I think it should be much easier to convince archivists to let us do that. Yes. Yeah. Pursuant on to uh, the gentleman's idea, uh, on a Hanasazi pottery, mm. we've taken fingerprints off that, yes. and we've shown provenance how the same thing that we're doing some of the same things. That's so cool. cool. Uh, I remember listening to something about some famous 
printed home, this ink froze, and that he had to lick his ink, and you could get analytes off that, and you would certainly get DNA off of it to or sequencing. Mm -hmm. And amylase varies by race, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell a lot about who and their gender mm -hmm. by, by, doing, um, by doing that. You can tell sex by amylase? Yeah, I think there's a the slightly different sequencing. Oh. I'm not sure. I'm honestly not sure. But okay. So for those of you who might not have been able to hear, uh, that's an excellent example of identifying the, the provenance, the, the movement of objects. You were talking about Anasazi pottery, did you say? Yes. And tracing it through fingerprints and being able to see when it gets moved along. Uh, but then also thinking about how sometimes you lick your pen to keep on writing. And that's absolutely something that we could be thinking about, but of course you can't go sampling for DNA just swabbing all over medieval manuscripts. Mm -hmm. And so that's another way in which multispectral imaging as the non-invasive starting point can be a good option because biological fluids like spit mm -hmm. fluoresce under certain wavelengths. And so we can essentially take the, the CSI approach and find um, bodily fluids and then determine what they are and whether they can give us biological, um, maybe even protein or DNA based information about who was using the book and how. You have to talk too much about ink, but I assume the process can be used when <laughs> the color looks exactly the same to the eye as to whether in fact it is the same ink. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking if you have a manuscript that has two different works in different parts. The script looks almost identical. The ink looks almost identical. Can this process be used to prove that they're not identical? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Can this process be used to prove the different inks are being used mm -hmm. in the same manuscript? Yes, okay. absolutely. And uh, to further that line of thinking, so this question is can we use this process to identify whether inks are the same or different when they look very similar to the naked eye. We often have in medieval manuscripts multiple scribes working on the same manuscript and we can identify that there are multiple scribes because they have different handwriting. And so we can identify where they trade off. But sometimes we don't know if they continue, like you just literally hand the manuscript to your buddy and he keeps writing in the scriptorium, or if it, gets, it sits aside for years and then eventually gets taken up. Something I'd be interested to know is if we can image those transitional pages and if we see that the ink is actually a very similar formulation, I would be more inclined to assume that it's a continuation that picks up right where the previous la scribe left off, not that 40 years passed and they're probably mixing their ink differently. So there's a lot that could come from that kind of ink comparison. I got very excited about the inks in this, so I'll be thinking about it. <laughs> yes, well. Never turn medieval is loose on your work, right? Yeah. Now, we want to do that. <laughs> um, it strikes me there's a, there's a small group in England that's working on scribal disabilities, which mm -hmm. blends a little bit with your work. Oh, yes. And um, uh, I'm not if you mentioned it before, I apologize, but have you seen any stains that you could hypothetically connect to a new palsy on the scribe's part who knocks over a bottle of ink? I mean, that mm -hmm. kind of a I, I, mm -hmm. I'm going to add that to your repertoire of potential explanations, and it might be a reason to link with this group then, mm -hmm. as your same hypotheses go on. Did you want to say something about that? No, no. did you want to repeat it and then <laughs> yes. say something? <laughs> <laughs> so what I was saying is that um, this might have a really uh, potentially very productive connection with a group in England who are studying scribal disabilities. So scribes who are professionally writing down manuscripts, and if they have a disability, what can we learn about that from their writing? Um, this is actually something I've been thinking about, not in terms of stains, but in terms of a particular 13th century individual that I've been spending a lot of my time with lately called the tremulous hand of Worcester, <laughs> a scribe with a disability in that he had a literally trembling hand. He wrote on a lot of Old English texts. He was studying Old English in the Middle English period. And he's very interesting because uh, one scholar, Christine Franson, has actually traced out what we think is a timeline of his life and possibly also the progression of a disability based on the level of shakiness in his handwriting. 
the thing I think multispectral imaging would be useful for with that is, sure, there might be stains. I'll let you know after I look at the manuscripts <laughs> this summer. But I want to know whether we can trace, again, that connection, possibly in terms of time. Is he using the same formulation of ink in manuscripts that we didn't think he was working on at the same time? When we have a scribe like the tremulous hand who's working in a whole catalog of manuscripts that were all at Worcester at this time in the 13th century, we can maybe look at the different inks, and maybe there are some stains, that show evidence of his working process and learn more about this really fascinating individual that is just, by the luck of those manuscripts surviving, an excellent and rare example of an individual with a physical disability from the Middle Ages. Yeah, so the comment is that swabbing for bacteria and viruses could tell us an awful lot. Actually, the group in York is doing some of that with this Gospel of Luke. They swabbed one of the images of a monk, because oftentimes these would be venerated by kissing them. And so they were looking for some kind of... Um, virus or bacteria, they found on one page, they found the common bacteria for acne, a lot of it. And on another page, they found Staphylococcus, which is very interesting. But yes, they're doing that. They're starting to do that. And I think we're really on a, a sort of a, a turn, actually, being able to, and this is something that's really important to me about this project, being able to include scientific technologies and bring scientific um, methodologies that have been in place for a long time in science, bringing them into the humanities and applying them to cultural heritage objects, to studies like this that can help us push us forward in our thinking and provide us with a lot more data to work with. Last question? Scribes and then say he, um, it's probably great, but I'm wondering why, first of all, were there women that were scribes at nunneries or abbeys, and if so, are you studying those, and if not, what have, why would women not be employed as scribes in the medieval time when the, there were so many nunneries and monasteries? Um, and you can find out very easily. The uh, question is, you mentioned he when you said the scribe, and I did note that. Well, I'm pretty sure and if you, if you heard me, I think I said he or she, as I always do. Because yes, there are, and there were women I like women using scribes. gender neutral plural terms, they, <laughs> actually. I think that's sometimes it's, it's clearly a he, sometimes, mm -hmm. if it's a male monastery especially, or if it's um, a particular kind of place or a document that was being written. But absolutely, there were women mm -hmm. who were scribes. And this scholarship is, has been coming to the fore, especially in the 1990s, especially in the 2000s. There's an awful lot of books. If you want references, I can give you references mm -hmm. of uh, particularly works of Alison Beach about mm -hmm. female scribes in monasteries and abbeys in Germany. Melissa Morton, a colleague of mine, has written a book, or her dissertation, soon to be a book, on female scribes and actually women in the monasteries in Florence making books and this was part of their economic support mm -hmm. for the abbey. So the more people are studying this, the more people are realizing, yes, this was, this was happening. It was all over the place and it just needs to come more into the popular narrative. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for female readers of yeah. medieval books in that there's long been an assumption that women just weren't as commonly literate as men, which statistically may well still have been true, but there are plenty of books that we know were commissioned for, made for, owned by women. And so perhaps some of these uh, minimally invasive or perhaps more invasive techniques for understanding the life of the book can tell us something about the life of women in the Middle Ages so that we can see what it was like to be a woman who had this beautiful book of hours, say, or that had a book that was not 
just religious. So seeing how these books were used can tell us things not just about life generally that is presumed to be male-coded, but also about women's experiences in the Middle Ages. Something that I would be very interested is mm -hmm. in uh, taking a book of ours. Sometimes from a book of ours you can tell if it was belonged to a, a woman mm -hmm. because of some of the Latin pronouns that appear in some of the prayers. And looking through it and seeing if there's a lot of wax stains around the outer margins of the folios and trying to put that together with the person, the woman perhaps, who was reading it. Any other questions? One more. One last. Yes. The word bookworms at the bottom on the right there, does yes. that refer to people who love books or worms? <laughs> That refers to the actual bookworms, yes. because part of this project as well, they were taking DNA from the holes, the bookworm holes that were dug down into the book, and the York team could extract a DNA and were actually able to say whether it was a beetle from the northern, that was traditionally found in the northern part of Europe, or a beetle from the southern part of Europe. And so that, again, has great implications for manuscripts in the future and manuscript studies. The, the beetles are from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't find any of their DNA in there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom.